So uh, today's keynote speaker is Robert Spano. Uh, Robert's an Icelandic Italian jurist who at the ridiculously young age of 47 was elected president of the European Court of Human Rights. And he served in that position for two years over a turbulent period in the history of the human rights protection under the convention framework. Having left Strasbourg, Robert now works for the law firm Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, and he is a law professor at the University of Oxford and the University of Iceland. He was recently elected to the Register of Damage for Ukraine, a new international body tasked with processing claims for damages aris arising out of Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, there could scarcely be a more distinguished career in human rights, and his is only just starting. So, Robert, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me and congratulations on the 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Lawyers Association. Uh, I give many speeches on the convention. I sense that this is a friendly room. <laughs> there will not, not be a lot of pushback uh, to what I'm about to say. Um, what I want to do with you, and I'm, I'm Sorry to Constantine because he's heard the pitch that I'm about to make quite a few times. Uh, I'm going to take you on a bit of a historical journey because after all, on 3rd September last, the European Convention on Human Rights celebrated its 70th anniversary from its coming into force. It was of course signed three years prior to that on 4 November 1950. So it is a milestone, 70 years for an international convention in the field of human rights is something that we should celebrate. What I want to say in the last in the next 20 minutes has three basic themes. Number one, the European Convention on Human Rights is a human miracle. I'm not going to shy away from that claim. The fact that the European continent has the European Convention on Human Rights, the fact that the European continent has an international machinery, a court, which can enforce the convention in a binding manner in 46 member states is a miracle. And this miracle may have been important in its first 70 years, but it is now, it is now when the convention really, really is important. It is because the European convention its genesis was conceived because of the frailties, the weaknesses of human nature, which we saw readily, I mean, most not of us, but our ancestors saw and experienced from 1939 to 1945. We drew lessons from what happened during that time. And we were led by the United Kingdom after what happened in 1945. Lessons were drawn by the adoption of the European Convention on Human Rights, because we understand that human beings, as Dominic Grieve mentioned, are often consumed by fear, by irrationality, by gut feelings, and therefore, the human frailties and weaknesses that we all from time to time endure have to be circumscribed by rules which guide us, guide our behavior when things get rough. And that is exactly the situation we are in now. The European Convention on Human Rights was less important in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s in Western Europe when we saw a rise of openness to European integration, to multilateralism, to internationalization of human affairs, where everything was fine and dandy, human rights were considered to be politically acceptable. There were ups and downs in the United Kingdom as elsewhere, when the United Kingdom were the recipients of judgments like Tyra versus the United Kingdom, Handy Side versus the United Kingdom, Dudgeon versus the United Kingdom, Malone versus the United Kingdom, maybe some of which you have talked about today. All of these judgments 
demonstrated some weaknesses in the UK's constitutional fabric when it comes to human rights. Is anyone calling into question the morality and the righteousness of Dudgeon versus the United Kingdom today on the decriminalization of homosexual behavior? Is anyone calling into question Malone versus the United Kingdom when in 1984, Mr. James Malone, an antique dealer in Dorking, had to endure a warrant based on nothing in UK law, no statute, which allowed the police to wiretap the individual. And the, re the judgment of the UK courts was, well, the police can do it because it's not prohibited. What happened a year after? The first ever statutory framework was put in place in the United Kingdom based on a finding of a violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. So my point is, the European Convention on Human Rights was conceived because what happens to all of us, and sorry to say also in the United Kingdom, is that sometimes we get consumed by self-pride, by self-conceit, by the bubble of national affairs. We get consumed and influenced by our neighbors. We don't see externally what is happening internally. And it is good, it is morally good, it is politically good for our future that there may be external supervision or external viewpoints that now and again, in a manner which is reasonable, proportionate, comes into play and gives us a heads up if things are going in the wrong direction. So the European Convention on Human Rights, which was conceived after the Second World War, was in my view conceived as a reaction to exactly the kind of authoritarian uprising we are seeing globally today. So what we should be saying to each others and to other and to those that still need to see the light, to again use Dominic Greaves phrasing, is that if we accept, if we accept the debunking and the abrogation of international human rights law, we are at the same time accepting that internally, and I'm not just talking about the United Kingdom, I'm talking about any European state, we will be put in a position that we accept that the neighboring polity, the day-to-day -day political life, and the judicial mechanisms in our countries, which again are judicial mechanisms, which by definition, I say this as a former judge, will be influenced by the way in which the political life evolves in the state in question will not be subject to any external scrutiny. The second point that I would make, one was the convention is a miracle. The convention is a miracle. There is no such mechanism in any other part of the world. And if one compiles all of the various judgments, all of the various initiatives, not only with the European Convention, but the Council of Europe in general, it is extremely difficult, in my view, to make the case that as a matter of aggregate assessment, the benefits have not outweighed the potential irritation which judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and outside influence may have had and may have from time to time. The second point that I would like after this first initial observation is more internal looking to the United Kingdom. What is the current situation in the United Kingdom when it comes to the protection of human rights? To what extent are human rights in actuality protected? How would we go about answering that question? Now, there are several ways of doing it. One is to ask, as some have mentioned, what is the state of play when it comes to the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Court and the European Convention on Human Rights? Is it the case that the European Court of Human Rights is on a daily basis 
monthly, every six months, continuously, frequently finding violations that disrupt the political, economic, and social life of the United Kingdom? The answer to that is absolutely no. In fact, the European Convention on Human Rights influence in the United Kingdom when it comes to statistics is demonstrative of an absolute success story in the following sense. The European Convention on Human Rights has been politically, judicially embedded within your constitutional structure in a sense that the protections of human rights and the refusal to protect human rights are decided by United Kingdom decision makers. This is a very important point. Judgments of the U UK Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, which refuse the claims made for human rights protections, which would then be subjected to applications to Strasbourg, do not go to Strasbourg. Why don't they go to Strasbourg? It is because all the work has been done in the United Kingdom. The ownership of the convention has become UK-based. There are exceptions, of course, but they are very few and far between. So it is, and this I've said before, it, it, it really pains someone that has given his life to the protection of liberal democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, that the main existential debate in the Council of Europe on whether to retain the convention is taking place in the state, which is the absolute success story of the European Convention on Human Rights. There is something schizophrenic going on in that sense. And again, to what Jeffrey said, it has, in fact, very little to do with the European Convention on Human Rights. So one of the problems with answering the question to your father-in-law is that the answer will not come from trying to explain what the European Convention has done for you, because that will not persuade those that are in the tunnel to enter into the light. It is a debate which I think the British people, British politicians, British academics, commentators need to have about, to some extent, what it is about the British psyche and British history that has allowed this discussion to go into that place. It will not be resolved by the European Convention on Human Rights. It will not be resolved with people like me or judges in the European Court of Human Rights. It will only be resolved internally if people start to listen to people like Bonnet, Dominic Grieve and those of you that are in this room, who talk about what are the potential harms? What would life look like in the United Kingdom without the European Convention on Human Rights? True, one can say that life wouldn't change so much, but actually that's a good answer because it demonstrates to what extent already the constellation of rights and values in the European Convention have, although potentially in a subtle manner, in an implicit manner, already started to be infused into the way in which this country thinks and does and acts and politicizes. The final point that I would make is a bit more technical. And it is this. The European Convention on Human Rights has two fundamental, fundamental innovations when it comes to human affairs. The first is its inclusive democratic concept. Democracy does not mean majoritarian omnipotence. That is a fallacy. Now, that's very difficult to say in the United Kingdom due to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. But democracy within the context of the convention does not admit of democratic, democratic authoritarianism. 
It requires an inclusive concept of democratic participation. And how does this play out in the convention? Why does the convention require that all measures, including legislation, pursue a legitimate aim? Why do measures that interfere with human rights, why do they have to be prescribed by law? Why do measures that interfere with human rights, why do they have to be proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued? Because these principles, they regulate human behavior. They allow the, they, they inhibit gut feelings, fear, knee-jerk reactions to be the basis for policymaking. Because when you have to find a legitimate aim, when you have to actually promulgate a law, when you have to act in a proportionate manner, when what you need to do has to be necessary in a democratic society, it makes you it makes you need to calm down and think reasonably about your options. This is ultimately one of the biggest contributions of the European Convention on Human Rights in the domestic legal scenes of the Council of Europe. And finally, I mentioned the inclusive democratic concept. Finally, the rule of law. And I'm gonna end with the rule of law because the future of the European Convention on Human Rights will be about the resurgence of this fundamental principle, which is ultimately the principle that limits abusive human action it is the principle which the European Court of Human Rights has been enforcing since its inception in 1959, for almost 64 years. The rule of law is a concept, and I, I have argued that the concept under the convention is the Bingham-esque concept, which he proposed in his famous book. It is not the pure formal concept adopted by Joseph Raz and others. It is a substantively full concept, which requires not only that laws are meant to be formally foreseeable, perspective, and so forth. It is a concept in which legitimate aim, proportionality, reasonableness in political decision-making has to then transpire and be promulgated into laws. The European Convention on Human Rights is a miracle. The European Convention on Human Rights encapsulates the principle of inclusive democracy. The European Convention on Human Rights is the ultimate manifestation in Europe of the rule of law. And at a point in time today, when all of these principles are being called into question, now is not the time, now is not the time to forsake and consider that the European Convention on Human Rights is not necessary for the future of democratic society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. That was very rousing and inspiring. Um, any questions from the audience, please? Yes, sir. Yes, there's one just coming. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was excellent. Really interesting. And it stimulated a thought. My name is Conor Geerty. I work at LSE. And this is the thought. We emphasize subsidiarity and procedural rectitude when we look at member states and see whether they've thought about the convention before they come to their decisions and so on. And it's very attractive because it kind of is a way of making sure countries internalize it. Uh, but then I look at the British parliamentary system and I see an executive that dominates parliament. I see completely empty invocations of rights and I see how much more sophisticated it could become where uh, a government goes through the motions and they control the house so they can pretend to be concerned about rights and the record seems to suggest it. And then I look at other countries which have a control of the population through the media, increasingly centralizing their own power through media control. There are tendencies in that direction in a number of member states of the Council of Europe. And this is the question. When you're, as you were as a lead judge, when you're 
having a look at countries and looking at whether they've breached the convention? Do you have a sort of in your mind uh, an A-list of countries where democracy really means democracy and you can trust the subsidiarity, a B-list of countries you're not so sure about, and a C-list of ridiculous places that have somehow or other scrambled into the Council of Europe and really don't deserve to be there? And do you deploy different standards? Do you ever attack explicitly the political complexion of the democracy as a way of underpinning a critique of their deployment of rights language? Thank you, Professor. This is not the first time I've I've received this question. Um, those that follow potentially Strasbourg case law and my own writings on this know that I am a fervent advocate of the principle of subsidiarity. And I think one of the reasons that it has one of the reasons we are now in a situation in the European sphere that the criticism leveled at the court, which was at its apogee when the, Brit the, the, the UK had the presidency of the Council of Europe in, in 2012 and the Brighton Declaration, which Dominic mentioned, was adopted, is that the court has, in my view, correctly, adopted a position where not all states and not all national jurisdictions are created equal. Now, what I mean by that is deference by the court is earned. It is earned by a sustained engagement with the convention and the principles under the convention long middle to long term which demonstrates a good faith engagement by the way in which the human rights issues are dealt with at the level of parliament at the level of the courts so the answer is the standards are the same standards are the same but the domestic application of those standards varies because the domestic situations are different so for example when I dealt with cases where I, in UK cases, in front of me was a judgment of the UK Supreme Court with the analysis forthcoming in the judgment on the one hand, and I would have on the other, maybe the same day, a judgment of the Turkish Supreme Court. And you see the analysis and you see the way in which the reasoning is framed and you understand by the way the application is framed what is the factual context? Because the European Court of Human Rights does not operate in a vacuum. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand the difference. So the criticism often leveled at the procedural bent in the court, that it requires the court to look behind mirrors or walls to see whether states are acting in good faith. It is not as complicated as that because the court is 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 constructed by human members they are part of the community of judges in europe they're part of they are aware of the national developments in the state in question and all of this is brought out with reports uh, the council of europe is very much situated on the ground so i have not felt this to be problematic in the actual application of the principles anybody else like to raise the question. Yes. Sophie. Hi, Sophie Kemp from Kingsley Napoli. Um, I was really interested in your final comments on the rule of law, which is a subject very close to my heart. And it seems to me that there is, you're mentioning um, the rise of authoritarianism, that there is a lack of trust in the rule of law. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts are. And by that, I mean, among the public and states, just kind of trusting in in, in legal mechanisms to resolve disputes. And I just wondered what your thoughts are about how we might kind of build, bring more confidence and a better understanding of what the rule of law is. I intentionally decided in my keynote speech not to talk about, uh, which I think this group and others similar need to talk about. And that is, why are we in this position when it comes to the narrative of human rights and the rule of law? And my view of that is the rule of law and human rights has for too long been a monopoly of legal elites. It is conceived by the regular person as a construct of power holders, people like us. They tend to think that human rights are being abused, being created, being enforced for the preservation of vested interests in society. Secondly, 
there is, especially by the populists, there is a use, a clever usage of human rights rhetoric and rule of law based rhetoric to demonstrate uh, an element of subjugation on behalf of those that hold the reins of power. So what has to happen in the future is human rights has to be brought down to the level of the normal person who is not in the legal establishment. I've made the argument for years, we should, when is the first time in English curricula that a child hears about human rights or the concept of democracy? You know, we, we, we don't learn these fundamental concepts early on, certainly not in my country, but why is that? That I think it demonstrates that, you know, at the, at the, at the base level, there is a lot of simple education that needs to happen to take this away from us and make it mainstream in the hearts and minds of regular people. This has been a domain which is very much occupied by those that have, have been creating the edifice of human rights in the last 20 or 30, 40 years, which has mainly been practitioners, to a certain extent politicians as well, and judges and so forth. That's not the way, ultimately, a sustainable system of law can continue to survive. So we are at an inflection point in the human rights debate. And for the Human Rights Lawyers Association, the future should be, let's, in this room should not be just us. We should be in a position to try to educate those, speak to those about what human rights actually are. They are not they are not an end, they are not the enemy of the people. They are what we believe actually creates prosperity. The second issue that I wanted to mention, and I didn't do it in the keynote speech, is a narrative where human rights, the rule of law, is synonymous to some extent with the liberal democratic co concept which is synonymous with a market-oriented capitalist environment which breeds inequality in society. People believe these things. They believe there is a clear synergy between liberal democratic values and the lack of substantive equality. And I think there is something to that. So we have to, when we hear people which are in the tunnel and haven't seen the light, internationalism globalization where the european court of human rights is one of those manifestations is considered to be one of the ills that breeds the marginalization at a substantive equality level in some of our member states and that's what the populace feeds on and that's what needs to change but that's not changing the european convention on human rights it is changing other elements in the narrative Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Robert, for your for your lecture. I I have a friend, uh, and this friend he 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 was a big fan of Radiohead, <laughs> and he would go to uh, Radiohead's concerts like uh, in a tour in different uh, cities, and he would go to when he was younger to three four different concerts. And I was always asking him, like, why do you do that? They do exactly the same, like, every time you go to the concert. He said, no, no, don't be stupid. Like, they're all different. Every single performance is absolutely unique. So I've been to a couple of Robert's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Robert's well, like... very A couple is a bit limited. To... <laughs> uh, Robert's uh, lectures, and they're always different, uh, and uh, always very clear and very well articulate. Uh, so thank you for that. I wanted to be a little bit uh, uh, provocative here, and you made very, two very, very interesting arguments. First of, first of them is about the fact that uh, uh, court case law age, uh, ages well, right? Like, so we look at Tyre and we think, oh, yeah, well, that's, that makes sense. Good. And the second argument uh, is about the fact that basically court bashing has negative effects around, like, well, outside the United Kingdom, outside this country, etc. I agree with both of them. 
my question is why those people like normal uh, voters in the united kingdom actually care about that right why would they care that in 30 years we can sit down in human rights lawyers association celebrating i don't know like 50 years of the association saying okay this case uh, 30 years uh, ago was really good uh, why would they care that uh, basically the fact that uh, British government is uh, very negative about the European Convention on Human Rights will have a very good argument to, in, in Hungary, um, basically, uh, uh, when their government is doing the same argument? Why, why, like you were just saying, talking about explaining it to uh, normal people, uh, why should they care about these issues? Thank you. Well, ultimately, I think the, the, the only answer one can give, and which in my view is a very strong answer, is uh, probably an answer which I heard Lord Bingham give, which was, here's the European Convention on Human Rights. Okay. Now, we are talking about leaving the convention. Okay. So if we could just do it sort of marginally, what rights did you would you want to be without? Okay. Let's... So, Mr. John Smith, would you like to have no freedom of expression? Would you like to have, you know, would it be prescribed for you to go downtown and wave a flag and say, you know, your mind? If you are quite religious, would you be okay with a society where you're not allowed to manifest your religion? Are you okay with discrimination? Are you, and so forth. The problem, I think, sometimes is human rights debate is very much about very topical political issues. In this country, migration, pretty much. So people have sort of, because not everybody has had a lecture with Constantine on human rights. So they're not, they're not going to be sure about what human rights necessarily are unless you can actually sit down and start going through the list the list is, of course, not the right word. Going through the multiple manifestations of what human rights are and simply ask the person, would you like to live a life in a community where these rights are not protected, where you're not sure that you can rely on them? And I think that's going to be a very persuasive conversation you can have. But that's, of course, requires an outreach. It requires a lot of good willing people that are willing to give time to be in an educated role. But that's really, that's why I said this needs to start at, at the base level. It needs to start an educational system. It needs to start, you know, my sons, my, my children, they have had to endure a human rights lawyer for, I don't know how long. I'm not even sure my 14 year old is fully aware of a lot of the issues. Maybe that's my, my fault. But that's where it needs to start. It needs to start at ground level. Do we have time for just one short question? And there was somebody at the back. Yes. Hi, thank you for your keynote. Um, my name's Melissa, I'm a trainee at KN. And I just wanted to pick up on your point about teaching um, um, the younger generation about education, about human rights but not, not necessarily the generation in the school, but the generation, you know, Generation Z, you know, the generation that dominates social media because they are the ones who will um, will take that narrative of what human rights means to them and spread it around the world. And I think what I see anyway in that generation is just, they don't believe that human rights serves the West unless it benefits. So they don't believe that the West truly believes in human rights unless it benefits them economically, which you have picked up on that point. So for example, we can see outrage in terms of the Uyghur crisis and how they're treated. But um, when it comes to other issues around the world, they tend to be neglected. And if we say we believe in human rights and we talk about how, you know, how important it is, which has been emphasized today, why doesn't that appear to be re replicated for everyone throughout the world? I think you said um, it has to be equal for all. Um, a lot of young people don't believe it's equal for all. So how do you change that narrative to ensure that what we're saying here today can actually, a, a change yeah, I mean, can actually it's, be it's, made? It's a huge question. One of the most toxic elements for, de for democracy and human rights is our double standards. 
they are extremely toxic because people people are very sensitive to double standards. You know, people don't have to be lawyers or, you know, people have a sense of justice. And when they sense that, you know, people are being very principled in one scenario, but are lacking principle in others, because there are double standards which serve their purposes, that undermines the whole constellation of principles and values that you're trying to promote. So I couldn't agree more. And to be very frank, you know, I am not here to say that, you know, the West, the global West or whatever you want to call it, which is the genesis, at least historically, of what we term a liberal constitutional democracy has actually been doing that very well. I think there are a lot of problems with that. But that that in and of itself does not negate the need for good people to continue to fight the good cause. I had a good conversation with one lawyer today. We were talking exactly about what we need to do in this existential fight that we are uh, we are having at the moment. We have to become legal populists. We have to we have to use, in my view, the same kinds of methods based on correctness, not misleading, not misrepresentation, but we have to speak the good fight. We have to radicalize the concept of liberal democracy and human rights. You cannot win a war of rhetoric and narrative unless you actually try to pierce the hearts and minds of peoples. And you cannot do that by being, you know, talking about proportionality and legitimate aim and, you know, the principle of subsidy. Nobody is going to listen to that. We have to talk about these issues in a manner which people understand. And frankly, today, you have to use the means that the populists are using themselves, social media. You have to use fora where you can use words which resonate. You have to talk about what could happen in a world where human rights are completely eviscerated. You have to make a distinction. You have to make the connection between the convention and its historical genesis. I, I'm not preaching fear mongering, but almost. I'm simply saying this is an existential struggle for our values for the future. And it is important to take the fight to the enemy. That's simply where we are at this point. And I see some, I am very happy to see in the United Kingdom, because here the debate is vociferous and very, very visceral, that to see really, really strong individuals, like we're on the panel just now, willing to take that debate to where it should lead and are putting it in a positive, you know, constructive, forceful way, because ultimately they believe that's best for the British people. Course. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to have to just dip in at this last second. I'm Pierre McClue from Bail for Immigration Detainees. And I just, I, I was reflecting on what you were saying and I, and, and I want to try and simplify certain points that are in my mind. And I think I'm going to end up with a question, although it's been partly answered by you as well. And it seems almost as if human rights has arisen from the black and white world of the Second World War. Um, it, it's, it's become archaic. People don't really understand it. Um, lawyers, many of whom here give of their free time to our organization um, and legal aid lawyers who work amazing number of hours are putting forward those arguments, but we're and, and are representing us in the Supreme Court and putting forward our evidence, which has been which has made a difference. But we're still in a world where emergency measures are meant to be announced probably next week to send people to a situation which will result in their um, refoulement to inhuman treatment, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and we're in a situation where we've had legislation passed that allows the detention of children and vulnerable adults. Um, and, and there's now impossibility of raising certain challenges. Um, it seems 
that in that context, as an organization, we've turned around and thought, well, the, we're going to go back to the days when we lobbied the Tory party and the uh, Liberal Democrats um, before 2010, um, and we persuaded them to end the detention of children. And that was the scare stories. That was the reality of the stories. And somehow we have to bring to the decision makers those human stories, the human stories in color now that we can give, um, the, the human stories that everyone saw in, uh, after the Second World War that motivated people. And, and just one last point is, and the agenda at the moment is run on foreign national offenders, um, which seems to have run the discourse completely in the narrative. And that's where we also need to be focusing when you have such a negative story, you have to focus upon the fact that you're not talking simply about migrants, although that might excuse the law, unfortunately, but you are also talking about British people uh, who have been brought up in the UK and who are facing such treatment. The only thing that I would say, and I, I think now it's almost a year since I left the court, so now probably I'm allowed to say things like what I'm about to say. If there ever was a reason for the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court as a potential external mechanism in a country which is based on the constitutional principle of parliamentary sovereignty, it doesn't have a written and a limited constitution, it's the Illegal Migration Act, with all due respect. The Illegal Migration Act, my dear friends, in the Western Hemisphere is unheard of. Let's just be frank about this. This was passed by the UK Parliament. So if you're having this debate about what could potentially happen in this country, not only in this country, in other countries as well, look at that legislation <coughs> and what it actually permits. And as the UK Supreme Court in its Rwanda judgment makes absolutely crystal clear the European Convention on Human Rights is only part and parcel of an international fabric of norms which is based on basic human morality. It was passed by the UK Parliament. I don't want to end on that note. <laughs> but that simply, I think, resonates with what I said. The European Convention on Human Rights has never been as important as it is today because we are seeing politicians take decisions like that. Robert, thank, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, it's a great privilege to have you here, and, and thank you again. Um, can I just detain you for another minute? Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to all the panelists and obviously to our keynote speaker and to all the contributors to this um, publication that I hope you'll take away. Um, thank you to Kings in Napoli for very generously hosting uh, today's event. Uh, and can I thank the organizers and particularly Sherab Khan, who's sitting over here, one of my vice chairs, uh, whose idea this was and who's put in an enormous amount of effort to bring this on, uh, so bring this off. So thank you to him and, and your colleagues. Um, if you've enjoyed today's gathering, please spread the good news and encourage your friends and colleagues and your neighbors to join the HRLA if they're not already members. I have one final very pleasant duty to perform today. Um, I want to say a special thank you and goodbye. Our magnificent administrator, Karen Kinross, has completed five years in the job and sadly is now moving on. Um, can I call Karen up, Karen up please, uh, to, uh, to thank you for that. <laughs>